elevating the discussion while talking about the things that matter most. You're listening to Society and the State. Life, liberty, and your pursuit of happiness. Now, your hosts, Connor Boyack and Brian Hyde. Welcome, everybody. Episode 107 today, talking about what you've heard, no doubt, in the press over the past uh, couple of weeks about Alex Jones and InfoWars being censored. It's actually a little bit broader than that. This idea or development where Facebook and and YouTube and Twitter are engaging in so-called censorship of uh, one or more people in particular. Surely you've heard about it. There's been a lot of buzz. Um, but there's some some interesting angles that we wanted to unpack that uh, Brian and I felt were not being uh, adequately discussed. Maybe, Brian, I want to start maybe with the legal one first. It's been interesting to see a lot of people on the so-called right uh, arguing against this censorship. Uh, let's maybe back up for the you know two or three listeners who haven't heard what's going on. So Alex Jones is a very, uh, you might call, extreme or fringe uh, type of content producer, uh, conspiratorial, et cetera. Uh, Infowars is his website. And uh, very recently, uh, he was shut down from the major social media, media networks in a coordinated effort, uh, it clearly appears, to uh, take him off of those platforms. This wasn't like one network did it, and then a couple of weeks later, you know, another said, oh, well, after deliberations, we've decided to also do it. This was like same day, right? Um, and so that was the development. The, the interesting thing, Brian, and I want to get your take on this, is um, whether the First Amendment has any bearing here. Because I've seen you know, conservatives and folks on the right who are concerned with this for a good reason uh, that we'll also address uh, on this episode. They're concerned with it, but they say, oh, it violates you know, the First Amendment. Alex Jones has a First Amendment right to, to speech, and these companies are, are restricting his ability to uh, engage in that speech, and, and that's wrong. Brian, what's your take? Well, the the Ayn Rand devotee in me has to concede that, hey, it's their company, it's their rules. So in in the interest of observing private property rights, yeah, the case could be made that uh, they they certainly have a right to do so. The fact that it all happened very quickly and that uh, not just Alex Jones, but um, notable people like Daniel McAdams Mm -hmm. with the Ron Paul, uh, I think it's the Ron Paul Report. Institute. The Ron Paul Institute. And uh, Scott Horton with Anti-War Radio. neither of which are as over the top in their approach as Alex Jones is. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to give Alex Jones the benefit of the doubt. His delivery, his uh, persona, if you will, is the, uh, you know, pound the pulpit, foaming at the mouth, mm-hmm. populist uh, kind of uh, rhetoric. And, and it resonates with a lot of people. I mean, I've, I've been a talk radio host for a lot of years. You throw red meat, you will generate an audience. And he has generated undeniably right. a huge audience. But it's disturbing to see other people who are not nearly in that same vein of delivery and maybe who have a different slant on things also being censored. So um, it, it concerns me. And, and probably the biggest concern is um, it's, it's the idea that these social media giants or these tech giants appear to have been uh, brought into the government's inner circle. And, and I think that uh, you know, there's, there's state censorship and there's corporate censorship. I think what we're seeing here is is kind of a merger of, of those two worlds meeting. I think it's difficult in a day where, you know, we have this kind of quasi-monopolistic environment in which, you know, there are the big boys in the room, right? And, and, and you have what's called the network effect. I remember this was the case with AOL Instant Messenger uh, in the late uh, 90s and early 2000s where, uh, you know, in America, uh, most people were using... Uh, AOL Instant Messenger, because that's where all their friends were. And MSN Messenger, not so much. You know, you usually had it for that rare circumstance where that one friend had it. But uh, then you go to like a Latin American country, and MSN Messenger, by and large, was where people were at, because that's where their friends were at. Um, and so, you know, then MySpace, right? Then Facebook. And so you go where your friends are. These networks are powerful because they are networks, and they they uh, they draw you in because, you know, 80% of your friends are there. You might otherwise hate Mark Zuckerberg or hate Facebook, but you know what? If you want to be engaged in your, you know, family and friends' lives in an online, uh, you know, capacity, um, that's where you go to do it because that's simply where they are. And and so, you know, I, before moving on, though, I want to kind of dispense with this idea that, that the First Amendment strictly construed or even broadly construed 
has any bearing on this issue, right? Like Congress shall make no law. It doesn't say that Facebook right. shall make no internal policy. Um, and so in, the, in a, a very literal and, and, and direct sense, the First Amendment has no bearing here. That is a restriction on government speech. That's saying that if you're down at City Hall, uh, right, or you show up on, on the, uh, the lawn at the Capitol uh, and you've got a sign and you got a bullhorn, right, or you're printing a publication, you know, that's when the government can do nothing to uh, prevent your speech. They can't uh, arrest you for it. They can't, you know. Um, and, and so this is different when we're talking about corporations. I, I concede the point that, you know, when you talk about Apple, Facebook, uh, Spotify, YouTube, uh, Instagram, when all of these companies coordinate to say, hey, Alex Jones, we're shutting you down. And why? Well, we classify your content all of a sudden. Right? I mean, you've been doing this for years, but all of a sudden... We're coordinating to decide that what you're producing is, quote, hate speech. That's a problem. And, and hate speech in and of itself should raise some red flags. When, when we say, okay, he's guilty of hate speech, can you tell me specifically what that means? What, what did he say that constitutes hate speech? I don't think anybody has specified. Uh, not that I've seen. So we're left to our own emotional associations to determine it's this is this is what's called the uh, the unspecified predicate. Mm -hmm. He's been accused of hate, which we all know is bad. Right. But it doesn't tell us exactly what he did. I mean, this is you, you've worked in public policy for a long time. Laws need to be very specific, and if they're not, then they can be when they're ambiguous, they can be abused because they can cover virtually anything that they want to. I think the accusation of hate speech is one of those things where the accusation is as good as a conviction. Because the, the person making the accusation doesn't even have the burden of proof. Well, what exactly did Alex Jones say mm -hmm. that would constitute hate speech? We're just told he, he said hate speech, and we draw our own conclusions, and presumably because hate is bad, he must have deserved being banned. And so you see Apple, when they uh, announced their reason, they simply said Apple does not tolerate hate speech. Uh, As defined by whom? <laughs> uh, uh, okay, thanks, Apple. All right, like we all agree, right? Uh, uh, YouTube said, when users violate our policies against hate speech and harassment, we terminate their accounts. Uh, Facebook said that they were using dehumanizing language. Uh, I'm sorry, but like plenty of politicians do, and yet you let them keep their accounts. You know, I mean, th this is like a, a un not unenforced, it's a unevenly enforced uh, set of policies that, Brian, to your point, the definition is so broad that it just allows total discretion on the part of whoever's enforcing it, you know, it's like disorderly conduct. A police officer can stop me on the side of the road and I'm goofing off at 2 a.m. and being unruly. Nothing illegal, nothing vulgar, nothing, no problems, but he just decides on his own that he doesn't like what I'm doing and he tells me to knock it off. And I'm like, dude, I got a right to do this, you know, go pound sand. And, uh, and he decides to arrest me for disorderly conduct. Whereas like a, let's say an attractive woman is being very vulgar and, causing many more problems uh, in terms of nuisances to neighbors or, you know, customers at a business or whatever. Uh, and, and that may be clear disorderly conduct, but the officer on their own discretion, because that term is so broad, will say, no, I, I just don't think this is disorderly conduct. I think those broad terms just empower uh, uh, people, right? In this case, corporate titans, but otherwise speaking, government, right? When you have these broad terms. I think it's worth pointing out, too, that uh, Twitter did not go along with this ban with all these other social media giants. And Jack Dorsey, I think it was an MSN story that I saw yesterday, the headline read, uh, uh, Twitter CEO fails to ban Alex Jones. And I'm like, wow, there's a little editorial right there in the, totally. the headline. Um, but his explanation was he hasn't violated our terms of service. Mm. And I mean, I don't know, you, you've been on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, Sometimes that makes a Texas cage match in professional wrestling look totally. civil by comparison. Yep. Yeah, and, and you know, the, the struggle here is that um, these are very centralized systems, right? Uh, let, let me talk about it from a, the, the vantage point of a content producer. Let, let's use my Tuttle Twins books as an example. So I've invested a lot of our resources into advertising on Facebook, also Twitter and Instagram and YouTube and others, but we're like 90% plus on Facebook. So our uh, page likes, I think we're about to pass 50,000. So we got like 47, 48,000, something like that, people who have liked our page. And that is, at, uh, that is the result of great time and expense. 
right? Because we do a lot of advertising to try and get people to buy the books and people click like on the ad. And then we uh, go in and we uh, click invite next to their name where we can see who liked, you know, the, the most recent ad will say, hey, invite them to like the page, invite them. to." So there, there's a lot of stuff going on here. We're spending a lot of money. We're spending time trying to draw people into our community on Facebook. Great time, great expense. Uh, other content producers are the same. You're on YouTube. You are obsessed about your subscriber count on every video. Hey, guys, like and subscribe, right, and, and get engaged in our community. Uh, you invest a lot, right? But at the end of the day, what content producers need to remember and what this Alex Jones story makes explicitly clear is that you own nothing on these networks. They're not your subscribers. It's not your Facebook profile. It's not your list of friends. It's not your, you know, page uh, likes on Facebook or whatever. Uh, you are using all of these at the mercy of the company who is giving you the platform. And what's astounding, what's what's frightening, is that despite investing substantial resources in these companies at the, the click of a button, at the whim of the discretion of whatever corporate whoever at any of these companies, all of that investment can just be obliterated. Right, like you can have invested all that time and money, and and it can be just totally extinguished, and that is alarming, right? I remember when I was getting into marketing, uh, uh, I had uh, one guy in particular I was following. He was making very clear, you don't own your data, you don't own your data. Make sure that when you're marketing, you are getting email addresses, right? You are getting direct contact information. You are getting cell phone numbers with permission to text, right? So you can directly reach out to these people because he was concerned and rightly so that if you invest all this time uh, in let's say Facebook, Facebook could go away tomorrow. Some upstart competitor could totally erode market share. And now you've invested in this platform that no one's using, or in the case of today's example, they could shut you down. That's a, that's a huge concern. I think one of the things that concerns me too is Facebook among others, I believe has been brought into the machine and, and by that, I mean the, the powers that be, elected and unelected, um, they, they have a lot of money at their disposal, which, you know, who, who are some of the richest people in the world? Mark Zuckerberg, are you? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's in his interest, because he's in those circles of the elite, to uh, to play ball. And I think that uh, it's, if I understand it correctly, Facebook, among others, have already altered their platform to uh, to help the various agencies that keep tabs on us, you know, the spy agencies and their their agents and counter agents. And so when when those uh, when those people behind the scenes say, hey, this this needs to happen, it's kind of like the, the board of directors, um, you know, the, the mega bankers sending a request through their board of directors. You're probably it's probably in your interest to right. to play ball. So I, I think that uh, these social media platforms, for whatever good they do, have been co-opted or brought into the establishment. And so I'm not saying Alex Jones is totally right on everything. I think there's some truths he speaks that they don't like, but whatever the case, it appears that they feel it's in their best interest to tell these social media or tech giants, you need to shut this guy up. And they're doing it. And and Brian, you're right to point out that Facebook has modified their, their algorithm, their newsfeed, their system in re large response to the election, to the supposed you know Russian meddling to the rise of so-called fake news. Right. And and so now Facebook is labeling these things and allowing you to, to tag and, and report these things, and they are on their own hiding these things and shadow banning them by... Demonetizing the ones that have unpopular opinions according to their guidelines. Totally. And, and what you're talking about, this kind of ultimate collusion between corporate and government, uh, is seen, I think, in a leaked memo. Uh, in fact, we'll link to this on... The show notes page, societyinthestate.com slash 107. This is a leaked memo uh, circulating apparently among Senate Democrats in United States Congress with uh, a host of proposals for regulating digital platforms, really authoritarian uh, proposals. It's called Potential Policy Proposals for Regulation of Social Media and Technology Firms. Uh, so this is a draft proposal. It was penned by Senator Mark Warner, uh, and it was leaked by an unknown, unknown source. Among the suggestions uh, are a mandatory location verification, so forcing social media platforms to authenticate and disclose uh, the geographic origin of all user accounts or posts, so basically total tracking every time you're on social media. 
mandatory identity verification. So you're having to, you can no longer anonymously create an account or, you know, create an account with a, a pen name for, you know, privacy reasons or whatever. Uh, and so they have to mandatorily identify you, much like in the financial realm where you have to surrender your driver license or some other photo verification. Uh, they now, uh, a few of these congressmen are now proposing to do that with uh, social media as well. Bot labeling, so somehow forcing companies to label bots or be penalized. No idea how that is even possible. Uh, defining popular tech sites, such as the ones we've mentioned, as, quote, essential facilities uh, that would allow the government to declare some sort of public interest in them and thereby regulate them and dictate even more policies on them um, and perhaps even over time subsidize them and, you know, prop them up, right, because these are the essential facilities. Oh, that upstart competitor, you're, you're not. You've not been so blessed, right? But we, we need to make sure that Facebook or YouTube are, are supported and, and continue to exist, but in the regulated way that we want them to. So uh, what you're saying, Brian, is not that far off when already we're seeing these, these congressional proposals coming out where that, that collusion or that encroachment is being increased and the overlap is being uh, augmented as well. So I think we're right to be concerned. One of the things that we have to consider, too, and this is, you know, just from, from strictly a personal standpoint, I did not sign up on Facebook so that uh, it would be my safe space so that it would shelter me from ideas or words or opinions that uh, I might find disagreeable. I went there to network, as you pointed out, um, and, and I, I encounter ideas and I encounter memes that, uh, that I don't resonate with. But it's not their job to protect me or, to worse, to mm -hmm. decide for me what's acceptable and what isn't. Mm -hmm. So um, for people who may be tempted to, to call on Congress, you should regulate these social media networks. You should no. No, the only person who needs to regulate what you see, hear, and read is you. And and that means state censorship is not a good idea. Corporate censorship is not a good idea. You know, if if you if there's any censoring to be done, that should be you know you you choosing which information adds value to your life and which doesn't. Put on your big boy pants. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> well, and and uh, t uh, touching briefly on something you said. These networks have the ability to shape public opinion, to shape your personal emotions, to shape the content that you see, and therefore the opinions you have by, with their algorithms, designing uh, what they will selectively show you. I, I have, I don't know, close to 5,000 friends on Facebook. I don't see everything they post. I don't see every page I like their post. Facebook has determined which things I will see. That is powerful in determining how I'm going to feel that day, what I'm going to have my daily rage be about, Right. Um, the, the people I'm going to grow closer to, the people I'm going to grow further away from, um, that's powerful and hence, I think, dangerous stuff. Let's, as we wrap up, Brian, let's at least touch on alternatives, right? And so as you look around like, okay, MySpace went away, Facebook come up, these are the big boys. They have huge, not even first mover advantage, but, you know, they have a lot of resources. They're innovating. They're stealing one another's features. I remember, you know, Instagram or I guess Snapchat came out with the, daily stories than Facebook did, you know. Um, so it's going to be hard to compete with these networks in a way that pulls the network of people away from the institutions into something new. Nevertheless, do you think that there are um, uh, options out there that people can choose instead? I think there is wide open opportunity right now. And what, it, what it's going to take is it's going to take the courage to step up and, and build new social networks, parallel social networks, if you will. Now, the, the biggest challenge, in my opinion, is we're creatures of habit. Mm -hmm. I mean, how easy? When I need to find something out, I don't, uh, I don't go to this new fledgling search engine. I go to Google because Google, you know, has probably the best chance of finding what I'm looking for. But we're going to have to, if we're serious about uh, availing ourselves of alternatives, like, I don't know, Steemit is one of the ones that's blockchain-based. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I think we've got to be willing to experience a little discomfort some people are going to be um, called upon to, to be builders, yeah. hire the engineers, hire the, the innovators who can make it happen. But it's a prime opportunity. I mean, if, if you ever had any doubt whether the powers that be really want to have that uh, distinction of, of telling you what is approved and what isn't, I think the writing's right there on the wall for anybody to watch. So let's let's build something new. I, I'm glad you mentioned the blockchain. At the end of the day, we trust these companies. We're We're investing in them. We're relying on them, and, you know, these people are heavily left-leaning. They do not have our interests at heart. These are not the right people to trust. 
And so I think the true competition we need, whether it's something like Steemit, which is more like a WordPress or a blog site, but you can, and I know uh, some organizations are, building on the blockchain uh, social media networks that could then rival the big institutions. And the, the benefit I see with those to actually draw people away is that you own your data. That's the whole genius of blockchain. You, you control it. So if let's say, imagine there's a Facebook on the blockchain and I invest all this time to get people to kind of like my page or participate with me, I own um, the data that I've invested in. Therefore, I as a, a company owner can reliably and predictably invest knowing that that return on my investment won't dissipate with the click of a button from someone who deems that we're engaged in hate speech or whatever. Um, you can't have people censor it, right? And that's that's the promise. That's the opportunity. I'm excited. Give it five or ten years. Who knows what's going to be out there? But to trust another, you know, centralized institution, let's say some other company comes along and, oh, we have a better feature set. We, we promise, right? We, we promise we won't censor you. I mean, it's like Google when they got started. What was their motto? Don't be evil. <laughs> and now eh, I'm not so sure they're living up to that, right? Um, and so the problem is human nature. The problem is centralized institutions. You know, as you point out, Brian, the collusion that then naturally happens with the state um, I think blockchain is a really exciting opportunity here. So I'm glad that we at least touch on that briefly. You know, the the whole thought of like, as goes Alex Jones, so may go we, right? As you point out, Brian, there were uh, the Ron Paul Institute guys, Scott Horton, Danny McAdams, excuse me, I was having a hard time remembering his name. Um, you know, uh, at the click of a button, any of us can disappear. And then all that investment and time and, and energy and effort is just dissipated. I think we need to take this opportunity to think very seriously about uh, the status quo and how we can improve it. So guys, that's episode 107. Stick around for uh, the next one. Episode 108 is going to be uh, really interesting, a topic that very few people are, are thinking about. It deals with your home, your property, and the free market. Stick around. Make sure you're subscribed. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to Society and the State. For show notes, archives, and more great content, visit societyandthestate.com. 